we're talking about all parking tickets. Yeah. 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 I want to recognize the land that we walk on, most recently under the care of the Mississaugas and the Nakata, but also the, the Huron-Winda, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, all the other tribes that have walked on this land since the last big ice falls moved back. We've been walking this land for a long time. We've been sharing it for a long time. We've been inviting people in for a long time, and we've been helping one another for a long time. One of the things we always did with people is extended a hand, offered a blanket, placed by the fire, some food, all those things are here. That companionship, that friendship, that mentorship. All those things that helped everybody move forward. We didn't like to leave people behind. That wasn't our way. That wasn't our way of doing things. When we come together like this, we take our time to recognize people. Who they are, what they are, how they want. And that respect that we have for those ones that leave the footprints. If anybody's... Um, I hope you all looked at the APAC video. There's that wonderful little story about leaving footprints that my son is reminding me of. How that each and every one of us does that. Whether or not we know we're doing it, we are doing it. So when we take this time to come together, when we take this time to share and acknowledge, hi, you're great, you're wonderful, you've done something, you've mentored, you've led, of course you've led, which we're very thankful for. So this is a special spot. And that we're up so high right now, couldn't help but pick up an eagle feather and think, wow, I'm a little closer to that eagle. <laughs> I think there's another bank that has a better view, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give thanks for that. I want to give thanks for the path that we're showing to walk on. I want to give thanks for the food that we receive that extends our life. And I want to give thanks for this idea that we can change who and what we are. We're not so much change, just carry on. We have adopted a lot of the technology. Since the first uh, newcomer rolled out a bolt of cloth or showed us a match, those little things that were so important, we had picked those things up and used them. And as a people, we change. We are still hunters, all of us. Everyone in this room is still a hunter. What goes in our quiver is a little bit different nowadays. The game that we hunt is out here in the city. And it's moving forward, it's becoming someone, it is changing, it's caring. But we're still hunting. I have different things in my quiver. I have a laptop. A cell phone, I have schooling, I have training, all those things are what we hunt. I think it's really important that we help equip the ones that are walking behind us with those same things so they can carry on that hunt, so they can feed their little ones, so they can house themselves, build lodges, help others in housing. I think that's an essential component of what we do at APAC. I think it's as ancient as those big ice walls that moved back so long ago. It's ancient as that fire that we use and the drums that we listen to and the voices that we speak with. We're still saying the same words. We're still honoring each other. We're still learning from one another. We're doing it in a slightly different setting, but we're still doing it. So for that, I give thanks as well. I want to I wanna stop talking, because I want to invite Gabrielle up to say a few words. Gabrielle is so special to me, so to step aside and listen. There's something in my, in my, my father taught me. At first, I used to argue the point, but now I understand it. I can't learn a thing while I'm talking learn very little. And when I take the time to stop and listen with my heart to others speak, I can see and learn a lot. I can certainly learn a lot from you, so I appreciate it. I'm very excited for the evening uh, we have planned ahead. Um, tonight is all about celebration. It's all about celebrating the excellence that we see in our very strong, very resilient uh, Indigenous community, and in particular in the, in the, in the Indigenous uh, professional community. So in honor of National Aboriginal History Month, as uh, Selena was mentioning, each year since the founding of APAC, uh, just four years ago, we've aimed to do an event to honor the month. Um, and this year, we wanted to take one of our key beliefs, the key pillars of our organization, which is recognizing excellence, and take that to another level. So for those of you who are members of APAC and, and might receive our newsletter every month, you would know that each month we recognize uh, an Aboriginal professional in the community. Now these people are students, um, they're professionals, they're leaders in all industries, uh, and we ask them a series of questions. And why do we do this? We do it because, you know, in the Aboriginal community, I look around this room and I, you know, I know many of you, 
people who have gone through so much, who have fought so hard, who are leaders in their positions. And we want to celebrate you. We want to honor your journey um, and really celebrate you know, your strength and resiliency. And in doing that, um, you know, provide role models for the next generation of Aboriginal youth. So for the last three years, on a monthly basis, we've profiled uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit professionals and students right across Canada. So what we wanted to do in honor of National Aboriginal History Month this year is take this pillar, uh, this cornerstone of our organization, and take it to another level. Um, and so what we decided to do was honor three Aboriginal professionals uh, who we've honored in the past and, and you know, who have continued that legacy of excellence uh, in their professional journeys, as well as their personal and cultural journeys as well. Um, I'm also very excited uh, that a good friend, mentor of mine, uh, Clint, is going to be speaking with us here. I, I think I, I attended many events with you, but I don't know if I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak, so I'm very excited uh, to hear you speak. And on that, I would also like to thank um, TD for allowing us to have this beautiful space, this beautiful venue, with this gorgeous, gorgeous view. Um, you know, when we were coming together and thinking of who is a supporter that would really, you know, take this idea, run with it, and support it, um, TD was the first organization we brought it to, and they absolutely got the concept and really, you know, helped support us all the way. So I really want to thank the leadership at TD and for allowing us this space to gather here this evening. So with that, my next task is to introduce um, Jennifer Page uh, to say a few words on behalf of our sponsor. Um, so Jennifer is the Vice President, Treasury and Balance Sheet Management, Front Office and Investments, it's a very long title, um, at TD. Jennifer? Pleasure to uh, to be here tonight, and it is a great honor. Um, when I was asked to to come in and introduce, I, I, gave, I got the opportunity to actually learn a little bit more about this organization, and, and I'm very eager to speak to more people this evening because I, I would actually like to uh, join as, <laughs> as a member. So I think this has been uh, um, I'm, I'm really impressed with the work's being done, and, uh, and and it really does give me an honor to be here this evening. So this evening I'd like to welcome um, uh, Clint Davis. Clint is a is Vice President of Aboriginal Banking here at TD. He joined TD back in 2012, where he, he was brought in to help grow the bank's efforts in Aboriginal business. Clint is an Anuk from Nunatsiavit, Labrador, and before joining TD, he was the President and CEO of Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. And I have the honor and privilege of working with Clint here at uh, TD. And uh, myself, I am a, a Métis woman uh, from Manitoba, uh, born and raised in, in Winnipeg. Uh, my family still is back there and are very um, active participants in the Métis community and part of the Manitoba Métis Society. Um, I have had the benefit throughout my career of having uh, Aboriginal role models and leaders uh, to guide me throughout my, my path and I continue as I grow in my journey every day to meet more and more incredibly talented Aboriginal leaders and role models uh, that I, I continue to um, learn and grow and aspire. And so Clint, of course, is among them. And uh, thank you for coming this evening. And I welcome Clint Miigwech. It's a real honor to be here and uh, to uh, get to meet all of the members of APAC. It is truly an incredible organization. It's one that I think has been long overdue. And it's wonderful to see that Gabriella uh, and, uh, and all of your team are the ones that were able to kind of really create this and take it to another level. And I'm glad that everyone is enjoying the, uh, the view, albeit a stunted view, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's not bad around the 54th floor. 
Uh, I think the largest building in Goose Bay, Labrador, was probably two floors. I couldn't believe it when I was actually on a, in an elevator before. Uh, it was quite remarkable that the doors would close and would open and you would actually be in another part of the building. The whole topic is excellence in Aboriginal leadership. So I'm going to kind of break this down a little bit because it's something that I actually am very excited about talking about. It's something that I studied when I was actually at the Kennedy School of Government. And it is about this idea of leadership. In 2001, I actually worked with the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. And we actually uh, created and developed a leadership program for Inuit leaders from Canada. So we actually had 25 leaders who came down to the Kennedy School for two days of leadership training. And specifically, they went through this particular course that I'm going to be actually pulling a lot of the principles out of in terms of leadership. And the professor at the time asked the Inuit leadership, what would you see as some of the key traits of a leader? And so people were throwing that out, vision, resilience, strength. Someone even threw, put, threw it was amazing because we had women there, but someone threw a great man. And so he's writing all this stuff down. I know, right? Great man. So he's writing all this stuff down on this flip chart. And then he starts going, no, 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 no. And so needless to say, the Inuit leaders are constantly kind of back. So who's this idiot? <laughs> In fact, some of the things that we actually see when we talk about leadership, and frankly, it's, it's uh, I think leadership is kind of used very loosely today, right? And I think we see sometimes some examples of this, right? So you got the one person, you got your followers coming after you. It's interesting that that person, man or woman, is red. I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, they're all sort of following that person. How about that? It's a great example of leadership, right? So I, right, Jennifer? So I, so I work with my team. I'm expecting my team to not only follow me, but they have to lift me. They have to lift me up as I point to the promised land. Right? So that's so, so, you know, this, I actually did a search last night and was looking up pictures of leadership, and I was coming up with this kind of stuff, which is actually kind of interesting. And of course, of course, we can't go beyond leadership to actually, without looking at something like this, right? <laughs> the great warrior. Man or woman, not really sure. <laughs> Very lonely up there, they're holding their sword. Um, it's windy, I, I don't get wind in my office, but sure, that's, that's what experience. In fact, the English word leadership originates from the ancient root leap, which meant to go forth and die, as in battle. So think about that. I like the cheese. Exactly. So that's kind of the concept that people actually have when they think of leadership, to go forth and die, as in battle. Um, so needless to say, my thinking around leadership is a little bit different. And so how many of you have heard of Dr. Ron Ivins. Not necessarily the sole warrior leading on his sword or whatever, but Dr. Ron Heifetz, he's the founding director of the Center for Public Leadership. He's a physician by training, but he gave all that up because he actually wanted to focus on leadership around adaptive change. And so he's a renowned expert in this area of leadership. And so he's written a number of books on this, and I'll be able to show you one specifically. Uh, and this is the one that actually was written in the mid-90s. And the premise behind this book is that it's, it's a distinction between routine technical problems, which, can, which can be solved through expertise or a quick technical fix. So you actually have a routine problem that can be solved by someone with managerial experience or managerial expertise or strategic expertise or a lawyer or someone of that nature. Uh, and that's compared to adaptive problems big problems for which there's no technical fix, things like crime, poverty, relationships with indigenous peoples, issues like that, which really require some fundamental changes in particular with values. So what he talks about in his book, which I tended to, to subscribe to, is that he looks at leadership not as a role, but as an act, right? It's an activity. You exercise leadership. And so what you try to do is that you're actually mobilizing others to face a conflict in their values for which there is really no technical fix or an easy answer. And what Dr. Um, Heifetz actually refers to, he calls that adaptive work. 
So he normally refers to people as trying to do the work. And that's actually really fundamental problems, fundamental issues for which they're questioning their values. So this is supposed to be activity. I don't know why it looks like activity to me, but they're all singing and dancing. and So, so leadership in and of itself is an activity. So it's not necessarily about a position of authority. And, and, and in fact, there's actually a huge difference between authority and a leader. There's a lot of people who are in positions of authority, but they've never, ever exercised leadership. In fact, you can have a lot of people who doesn't have any, who wouldn't have any authority whatsoever, yet they actually have the capability to exercise leadership. What you see in some positions, and it does drive me a bit bananas, because you do see it in the public sector, the private sector, nonprofit sector, everybody's leaders. They're not leaders, they're managers. They're individuals with an expertise to fix a technical problem. You, can, you don't have to be a particular individual in a, in a significant role, and I like that. The reason why I like that is because anybody can do it. So you don't have to wait to be the vice president, or you don't have to wait to be the CFO or the CEO. You can be an individual that can exercise leadership. Leadership can come with a position of authority. I don't know who that guy is, right? So um, if you are in a position of authority, and you do have to interface with a position of, uh, where you have to exercise leadership, authority in and of itself can actually be both a, uh, a resource and a constraint. So what I mean by that is do you actually have access to a bunch of tools that would enable you to exercise this leadership? And again, what I'm talking about is really doing that adaptive work, really questioning the values and the norms that exist in society. So one of the tools that a leader would actually have is that they're able to determine and basically start to, uh, uh, they can have the ability to uh, regulate the stress. So what you're trying to do, Neil's to say when you're actually having questions about values, more and more people don't look at that in a very comfortable state, right? So what the leader can actually do is sort of regulate that by actually creating conversation and creating this class of values, creating this disequilibrium, but not in a way that overwhelms people. It's actually, it can be done in a way that's tolerated. The other key thing, and this is critical, because it's actually currency for those exercising leadership, is getting attention. So you actually have your bully pulpit. So if you're in a position of authority, you do have that ability in order to bring attention to issues and actually start to direct people to start facing up to some of the issues that, they're, that that's existing in society. And so in the case of uh, Barack Obama, just recently, you've had issues around race, and Barack Obama was using the N-word. And so he's being somewhat provocative and actually trying to bring attention to something which has existed in the United States since the very existence of the country. So, in other ways though, even though you have a position of authority, it can actually be very limiting. Because when you're in that position, uh, individuals, when they're actually faced with having to really think about their values, they don't want to do that. People don't normally want to say, okay, this is what I stand for, but now that's actually turn on, on its head. Instead, what they want is they want a position of authority to protect them, to be able to say everything's going to be okay, to be able to say that they're going to dispel any level of conflict and maintain a level of equilibrium. So as an example, uh, in the mid-80s, so you can probably demonstrate how old I am, uh, George Bush, the first one, uh, talked about the war on drugs. And so what he wanted to do was actually say, okay, we're gonna announce a drug czar. And that drug czar is going to basically regulate and attack those individuals who are bringing drugs into the country. And so the United States and its population thought, well, this is fantastic, so we really don't have to do anything. You just turn to the government, and the government's gonna take care of all their problems. They're the ones that are gonna find the bad guys, smoke them out, put them in jail. When in fact, the real question is, what are we doing about it? Why are drugs actually coming into the country? What are communities and families and citizens actually thinking about why are drugs here? Who's using these drugs? Why is there such a demand for these drugs, right? Nobody wants to actually deal with something like that. So a position of authority can be very beneficial because you can re regulate that disequilibrium and conflict, but at the same time, 
you do have a lot of people who would expect you to make sure you protect them. So it is a bit of a challenge. The other thing is that you actually don't need a level of formal authority in order to exercise leadership. So I'm sure many of you in this room know who these women are. Jessica Gordon, Sylvia McAdam, Sheila McLean, and Nina Wilson. So those are the women from Saskatchewan, right, who created the Isle No More movement. And what actually started out as simply um, a concern about an omnibus legislation, piece of legislation being Bill C-45, which in turn raised very serious concerns around the environment and the impact on land management for reserves, actually, it, and this exercise, or this basic exchange of emails from these women started to explode and it extended well beyond the Canadian borders and actually went to the United States as far away as Ukraine and Australia. And what was fascinating about this was, uh, and even, it's, it's interesting because there's a parallel to what these women did and what Gandhi did in India. They took an issue which was very specific and very, very um, isolated, dealing with B, Sil B Bill C-45, but they turned it into something about indigenous relationships here in Canada, right? So there are some great quotes about saying that Isle No More is not just about legislation, it's about a call for renewal of indigenous identities and life ways. The leaders and spokespersons of the movement have no hesitation in linking the political to the personal, as the personal is very much a part of the movement. So it clearly led to a larger conversation for Canadians. Arguably, I'd say that with the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, um, that it's almost, uh, it's not necessarily without formal authority, because they do have formal authority, uh, but all they're doing, they don't really have any authority to change the values, but they're bringing attention to some of the challenges right now, and hopefully in order to change values in that respect. So, what does this actually mean? Particularly if you're exercising leadership, either with authority or without authority, is that it's pretty risky, right? So oftentimes, because what you're doing is that instead of providing answers, because you're not the one providing all the answers, despite the fact that people may look to you to do that, in fact, what you're trying to do is you're actually just providing more questions, really trying to force people to really uh, face hard facts and instead of protecting people from change. So think about just recently, right? So some of the issues that are facing today's society. What are people's views and, the, and their value systems around homosexuality? What are their views and their value systems are, around greater levels of authority for indigenous communities? What are their views around the cost, the cost of protecting the environment? These are all major issues which I think ultimately you're seeing some level of exercise of leadership. Now the challenge and the risk around this is that you're actually creating a lot of disruption for people, right? And a lot of uncomfortableness. Because what you're doing is you're saying the unsayable and discussing the undiscussable. You're asking people to effectively sustain a loss. So the loss could be real, it could be tangible in terms of financial, or it could be a loss of what traditionally they were very used to doing. So a part of their own value system. So in times, because individuals, particularly when you're with, without a level of authority, you actually embody these issues, right? So what happens is that these individuals get attacked, they get dismissed, silenced, and oftentimes simply discarded. And what Dr. Heifetz likes to call it is they, they have, they're assassinated. So you no longer become effective. So it's a fine balance to actually create that disruption uh, without necessarily being character attacked so you're no longer effective. So, so at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is that you do want to embody this issue, but you're trying to avoid actually being a lightning rod. So fundamentally, what you're trying to do in this situation is to stay alive, <laughs> plain and simple. <laughs> Particularly for the <coughs> moments of provocation. So his recommendation was to simply say, when you're going through this, oftentimes what you're trying to do is you're bringing attention to the issue, but you're trying to do this in a manner so people actually start to own the issue and start to have that conversation. And they start to kind of continue that conversation and it develops and evolves into something else. So he talks about using that level of provocation and then actually going up on the balcony, remove yourself a little bit and see what's actually happening and the evolution that's happening over time. So this is a very, very difficult thing. And when people ask me about leadership, you know, leadership is, I mean, again, it's not a role. It's not 
uh, it's not about making the big bucks or, or being able to tell people what to do. It's the really tough, difficult things. It's the really challenging things whereby you want to have an impact on either the workplace, on your team, or on society. And I think right now, particularly what's happening around Indigenous relations, this is a prime, prime example of Canada finally trying to think about what does this mean in terms of their own value system for Aboriginal people. So in leadership, you have to embrace conflict. I don't know why it's men versus women, but that's <laughs> it's a weird kind of thing, but it was late and I didn't know where else to find a picture. So anyway, <laughs> leadership is really about embracing conflict because it is the engine to affect change and ultimately to create, to uh, support adaptive work and innovation. It doesn't necessarily mean fighting in some companies, uh, seen here at TD, but they, they don't really want to use the word conflict because conflict obviously is a bit of a loaded term. So instead, what they call it is that they're leveraging disagreements. But effectively, what you're trying to do is orchestrating, <laughs> leveraging disagreements. It's almost as bad as decoupling, but we just split up for us. <laughs> but, uh, but you're leveraging disagreements, so you're orchestrating conflict. Because with conflict, with disputes, with, with, with some level of disagreement, you do lead to that level of um, change. The other thing around leadership as well, and this is one thing when I was going through this course, it was fascinating, it was actually rather humbling, is to learn from failure, right? So if we do want to have better leadership, a powerful source of learning is our own failures. Sometimes the most difficult thing about learning from failure is actually noticing and realizing that we actually failed. In some cases, it could, it could be something that you didn't even see, and you did fail at the time. So embrace, uh, right, Embrace failure. Embrace failure. <laughs> Learn from failure. Learn from failure. So ultimately, uh, see, I told you this is kind of new. So needless to say, there's a few little bugs I'm going to have to work on. But ultimately, what does this mean in terms of the context of Aboriginal leadership? And so one thing that uh, I did was I actually looked at a little bit of work that was done in a variety of different inst institutions. And it's incredible what the BAM Center has done around Aboriginal uh, leadership and leadership development. Um, as you can imagine, and I'm, I'm just, par uh, I'm starting to, um, well, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but ultimately, indigenous leadership wasn't necessarily done in a way where people were always elected, right? In some instances, you actually had historically individuals who kind of rose to the occasion at the end of the day through uh, what was referred to as natural order and laws of the people. Um, Fundamentally, though, from some of the research that was done, particularly uh, from the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development, when they looked at a variety of different tribes and sort of the historical value systems of these tribes, one of the common elements that they saw in terms of the fundamental effectiveness of Aboriginal leadership was culture and language. And frankly, that's actually no different than what we have today. Um, just recently, we had Wab Kanu, who spoke at a TD event, and he talked about where the young Aboriginal population is, which effectively is very um, prudent to this particular organization. And you have individuals, as he described, people with uh, technical expertise, doing very well in their jobs, but also having to maintain this level of connection to community, to culture, and in many instances, to language. And so uh, what I think is about maintaining and strengthening for yourself and your children, if you choose to have them, please have them, that will exemplify some strong leadership. So having those connections are absolutely key. So with all that, I hope you kind of walk away with a few messages other than yogurt on the back of my jacket. Uh, but specifically, uh, leadership is more of an act. It's not a role. All of us in this room can actually exercise leadership. Excellence is something which we should strive for, but at the same time, we can't be afraid of failure. And it's from that failure is when we, lead, when we learn. Um, and I joked about it, but in fact, you can embrace failure. Understand when failure happens, but also embrace it and learn from it. The other thing about, you know, it's, it, what is excellence? And we'll talk, and I'll hear from Gabrielle later about um, just the incredible work of, of some of the members. Um, but, you know, I always think, you know, as, as humans, we're, we're not perfect organisms, right? We're all sort of flawed in some way, shape, or form. And so, you know, there's bumps and bruises along the way, and, and we will fall down on many occasions, and that's fine. I mean, the biggest thing is how to actually respond to failure. 
And I think that fundamentally will be able to demonstrate where you're actually going to go in life. So at the end of the day, in my message would be to strive to be your best, strive to be excellent, and always remember who you are and where you came from. So hopefully you'll take that, and I hope that you learned a little bit about my perception of leadership tonight. So thank you very much. Now come in. Gabrielle's introduction and talk a little bit about um, you know the APAC, what we've been doing within our organization, the criteria of how we chose um, our three winners tonight. So role models play a critical role in our community, and since APAC uh, was founded, recognizing excellence in the Aboriginal community has been one of the one of our pillars that we continue um, to showcase strong leaders um, across Canada every month through our recognizing excellence program. So our first award winner tonight is Elisa Levi. Levi, so I would like you to come up. That's awesome. So Elisa um, works for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer as a Director of Strategy Implementation for First Nations, uh, Inuit, and Métis Cancer Control. She's absolutely passionate um, about change-making causes, and Elisa's contributions, uh, her leadership to various organizations. Recently appointed to the Board of Health for the City of Toronto, she is also the co-chair of the Aboriginal Nutrition Network, uh, governing circle director for the Circle of Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada. She's also advisor to Small Fund Change, Change Fund, as well as trustee for ENNE. Uh, Elisa possesses a Master of Public Health from Lakehead University. Uh, she graduated from Ryerson University School of Nutrition, pursuing a vibrant career um, as a registered dietitian. She is a proud member of the Chippewas of Maywash in Ontario, and Elisa resides in Toronto. Um, so again, I would like to invite Elisa up to the stage uh, to accept her award. She's most proud that she has been given the opportunity to work towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples through developing a cultural responsive relationship framework for the organization. The framework describes a decolonizing approach to working in meaningful relationships with Indigenous communities. Most importantly, it supports advancing the rights of all children and addresses the gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children in the areas of health, education, and child protection. Terry will also complete her MED this year, where she was able to enter the program without any undergraduate degree. She believes the opportunity to learn and critically reflect on her lifelong learning journey was a life-changing and, um, and profound for her, and she hopes to continue to inspire others to receive higher education, regardless of post-secondary education, because she was able to do it. In addition to her work and pursuing her studies, Terry still makes time to volunteer and currently teaches cultural safety workshops at victim services training sessions for volunteers in Southern Ontario. So I'd like to welcome Terry up to the stage to accept her award. <laughs> post-secondary education at Laurentian University, where he was enrolled in biomedical um, biology. 
that right there? <laughs> in the beginning, he was in pursuit of pure knowledge where he was solely focused on the academic aspects of university. At Laurentian University, Mark explored Aboriginal culture. Um, he did this through elders, um, visiting elders frequently, held tradition, where they held traditional teachings and where they were always available for him for informal discussions. This allowed him to synthesize his core values based on both Western and Aboriginal ideals, giving him the unique multi-perspective approach that imparts a deep understanding into the trajectories of being Métis. The union of the two distinct cultures as depicted in the Métis flag. This in turn put him in a position to advocate for Aboriginals in a respectful and insightful way, which he will forever uh, pres be present in his career as a physician. Because his core values are incorporated in Aboriginal values, uh, he's able to give an alternate views and to simulate discussions in his current pursuit of medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, again, I'd like to welcome Mark up, as he's already here, but... <laughs> <laughs> We have one last award to present tonight, and um, I know I'm jumping the gun on one announcement, but uh, Gabrielle is actually has been accepted to the Stanford Graduate School of Business, so she'll be pursuing her MBA next year. I will talk about her professional accomplishments because without them, she wouldn't have gone to the program. I uh, rather reflect on the two other uh, criteria that we use, the ability to be a role model and commitment to community. I think commitment to community stands for itself. Uh, if without her, none of us would be here in this room today. And you, you might be wondering, okay, if Gabrielle's going to California in two months, what's happening with the organization? So I would like to make a very exciting uh, and formal announcement. Um, so I'm actually stepping aside as president of the Aboriginal Professional Association of Canada. But in my place, I'm very excited to announce that we have two incoming co-presidents, two of whom you've actually heard from this evening. So Crystal and Laura. Um, 